Okay, well, good morning once again, everyone. And uh, today, we're going to be back in the Psalms. I just want to open with prayer. Let's ask God to bless the teaching of His Word today. Dear blessed God of heaven, in the precious name of Jesus, we approach you on your throne of grace with uh, hearts overflowing with gratitude. We thank you, Lord, that you have given to our, to our uh, trust and care your special infallible revelation, the Bible, a sacred library, 66 perfect books that express the heart of God. Lord, thank you that we have the Bible committed to us. Lord, may we be faithful custodians of the life-saving word that's here before us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd be pleased to bless the preaching and teaching of the word. We pray that every heart, every mind would be open to receive truth from God, from the Bible. Please anoint me to do a good job today, Lord, for you, that you'd be honored and glorified and that your people would be blessed. May these things be so this morning in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, dear saints, today we're going to be in the Psalms, Psalm 95. If you could locate Psalm 95 in your Bibles, Psalm 95, and we're going to be looking at a unit of Scripture. There's a whole unit here, Psalm 95 to 100, six chapters. I consider that to be a unit. You'll see these units in, throughout the Bible. Uh, Psalm 104 to 106 would be another unit. It takes you on a chronological tour th- from the beginning of the world all the way through the flood, through the call of Abraham, all the way through the Exodus, the Judges period, exile. It's all there in Psalm uh, 104 to 106. Uh, Isaiah 24 to 27, it's another unit there. They call it the little apocalypse. It, it looks a lot like the book of Revelation. And another unit would be uh, the book of Romans, chapters 9, 10, and 11. That's all is Israelology. You want to know about national ethnic Israel and the plans and purposes of God? That's where you would go. There's a little unit there. Well, today we're looking at Psalm 95 to Psalm 100 because in in this unit you see special themes developed, expanded upon, repeated throughout these six chapters. So we're going to be jumping, looking at different verses and different chapters, but we're we're going to be locked into this unit, six chapters here. I hope that makes sense. The first thing I see here, the first grand theme of these chapters or this unit of texts is a call, an invitation, an encouragement to praise and worship God. And so, friends, we're already on the right track because we just did that. (laughs) Thanks, John, for your help. (laughs) Let's read about it. Psalm 95, verse 1. O come, let let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to Him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth, the heights of the hills are his also, the sea is his, he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Well, there you have it, we'll just stop there. But this is a call to worship and praise God sincerely, joyfully, corporately, publicly, Multiple references to this kind of thing throughout the Psalms, throughout our little unit of Scripture that we're contemplating here. Remember, the Lord Jesus said that the Father is seeking worshipers. And to the extent that you and I are worshiping the Lord legitimately, honestly, sincerely, intentionally, we're giving the Father what He's wanting. And you'll be blessed for it, and He'll be honored, and Jesus will be glorified. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful truth. Look, please, at Psalm 96. Psalm 96, 1. 96, 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Proclaim the good news of His salvation from day to day. Declare His glory among the nations, His wonders among all peoples. Sing a new song. You know what, friends? You're never lacking material. You can always dream up new lyrics to sing to new songs to honor the God of heaven. You know why? Because his mercies are new every morning. And as I walk with the Lord, I see him blessing me every single day in new ways. And you open the Bible and you can read a, you can read a book of the Bible. You've read it a hundred times and all of a sudden today you see something new. Something new ju- jumps off the page at you. Isn't that true? 
because his, his mercies are new every day. And the word is a living and powerful uh, revelation from God. And he'll reveal just what you need for that hour when you need it. That's amazing to me. I remember wor- working at Standard Arrow, uh, Aerospace, bring my Bible every day. And my coworker came to visit me one time and he said, is that, a, is that the Bible sitting there? I said, yep, that's the Bible. Well, have you read it? Yes, I've read it. The whole thing? Yep. Well, why do you keep reading it? He said. <laughs> I said, because this is unlike any other book you've ever encountered in your life. This expresses the heart of God on the matter. And it makes simple people wise when they read it with believing hearts. And it gives you patience, comfort, and hope. And Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. And the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy and the whole Bible is about him. And of course, God is infinite in all his perfections and the Bible reveals God and so the Bible is mysterious and it's infinitely deep and you read it to the edification of your soul and it, it builds you up. And we are constantly confronted with new blessings every day as we walk with God and consult his word Never run out of material for new songs to sing, that's for sure. And in fact, the Bible tells us that God disclosed himself to his man, Moses. Do you remember? Exodus chapter 3, God said, Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh and you're going to demand of that man that he lets my people go from bondage. Give them liberty, give them freedom. And Moses asked God, well, what's your name? When I go to the children of Israel to tell them that, that you sent me, who do I say sent me? Do you remember what God said? He said, I am who I am. I am that I am. He said, you tell the children of Israel that I am has sent me to you. Now that's your little clue, friends, and mine too, that God is not the God who was. He's not I was or I will be. He is the God of the present. He's the God of now. He's the God of today. He is the God of this present moment. And you know what that means? That means that if you blew it yesterday and you did something horrible and stupid and something you regret, you can come to God to, today and he will wash you clean of sin and unrighteousness if you ask him to. He's the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances because God isn't like us. See? Remember the apostle Peter asked Jesus, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Like seven times, Lord? Is, would that be sufficient? <laughs> And the Lord said, I tell you the truth, Peter, 70 times seven. And by that time, it's become a habit that you forgive because that's God's heart on the matter. You come to God mourning for your sin. You you say, Lord, give me forgiveness, please. I'm sorry. And God is happy to cleanse you of all sin and unrighteousness. And you can start again. He's the God of now. He's the God of today. He's the God of the present moment. And in Psalm 96, you, you look at verse two again. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. There's another way to say that. It goes like this, preach the gospel. Proclaim the good news, preach the gospel. That's a New Testament directive, and that's not hard to do if you believe. One of the first things I started doing the moment I was a saved believer was tell other people about it, about Jesus. I knew nothing. I hardly knew this Bible. And I remember I took a young couple um, they were just a couple of years younger than me. I took them to Robin's Donuts and I opened the Bible to them. I had my special verses I could go to to show them that Jesus is the Savior of the world and they received Jesus for salvation. And I walked home. I felt 10 feet tall walking home. I said, Lord, I just want to keep doing this. And that's not hard to do if your heart is overflowing with gratitude for the Savior who loved you first. Paul says in 2 Corinthians in the fourth chapter, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. You can't stay silent on this, can you? Paul said in his first epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 9, he said, necessity is laid upon me. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And that just sort of comes with being saved. You just want to tell other people. Sort of like Philip. You remember Jesus called Philip to believe in him? And Philip was overwhelmed, and he ran to his friend Nathaniel. <laughs> Nathaniel, we found Jesus. We found the one that Moses was talking about. And he said, uh, he, that man comes from Nazareth. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? Well, Philip wasn't going to engage in some big, long, apologetical encounter. He just said, well, come and see. Just come and see. You know, you don't have to be a PhD scholar to be a soul winner. You can just tell people the truth. Tell them what you know about Jesus and what he's done for you. 
and let the Holy Spirit do His work. This is very mysterious, isn't it? This is a supernatural persuasion that has to happen. I, I really believe it. But God has chosen to work with His saints, you know. We are the custodians. of In all the world, we are the custodians of the life-saving gospel. God has not entrusted this to angels to get the job done, to tell people about Jesus. Angels don't do it. We do it. And you say, Lord, I'm amazed that you work with such imperfection, but God says, this is how I do it. This is how I've chosen to do it. And I'll get the glory when souls are saved. It's amazing. And that always reminds me of that uh, Roman centurion. Remember that Roman soldier at the foot of the cross when Jesus died? And there were supernatural phenomena. There was darkness, and there was an earthquake, and rocks split wide open. And do you remember what that centurion said? That Roman soldier, he said, truly, this man was the son of God. And that's risky. You don't align yourself with Rome's condemned enemy. You don't pro- proclaim publicly that you believed in that guy. You're with him because you might be the next one hanging on a cross. But you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, and that man could not stay silent. And real believers cannot stay silent about this. It just kind of bubbles out of them, and come what may. And we're to proclaim the gospel day by day, Yes, to non-believers, to people who don't know Jesus in a saving, redemptive way, we are called to tell them about Jesus, that they can have fellowship with us and with God. That's 1 John 1. John says, we saw Jesus, we handled him, we touched him, we ate with him, we know he's alive from the dead, and we've been called to share this message with the world so that others can have fellowship with God too, so that your joy might be full. Oh, God is very concerned with your mental, emotional health. Did you know that? God said, don't be troubled, don't be afraid. I'm giving you a Bible so that you can have patience, comfort, and hope. I'm giving you my word so you can have joy unspeakable and full of glory. The Bible wasn't given to frighten and confuse people. It was given to help us. God is for us, not against us, friends. We need to hear this. Yes, we give the gospel to non-believers as you have opportunity, but guess what? We give the gospel to believers too. Paul said to the Romans in Romans 1.15, I am prepared to preach the gospel to you in Rome also. You believers, I'm going to preach the gospel to you. I know you believe it. I'm going to give it to you anyway. <laughs> he told the Corinthians that, 1 Corinthians 15, you believers, I'm going to preach to you the gospel, the gospel that I gave to you personally. You're going to hear it again now. Why? Because we need to hear it. The gospel humbles man, puts man in his place without absolutely humiliating him. And the gospel honors and glorifies God puts God in his place too. We need to hear the gospel day by day. In fact, when you preach the gospel to yourself and to other believers, you're only doing what the writer to the Hebrews told us we should do. Chapter 3, verse 13, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you should be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And I, I just praise and thank God for my brother John Pauls over here, who a few years ago said, why don't you send out a regular devotional to people? Email out a regular devotional that turned into a real ministry. And I know there are people here who appreciate getting those devotionals. I'm, I found a way, well, John found a way, and I'm, I'm capitalizing on this, to exhort my brothers and sisters daily while it's called today. Well, secondly, I see in uh, this unit of Scripture uh, some reminders here about who and what the supreme object of our worship and, and uh, devotion really is. Who is this God that we're worshiping anyhow? Just go back to Psalm 95, 3. Let's look at those verses again. Psalm 95 and verse 3. For the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are His also. The sea is His, for He made it, and His hands formed the dry land. Our God is the creator and sustainer of the entire created order. All the gods of the nations are idols. The, the lesser gods out there, they did not create the heavens and the earth. Now, the Bible makes a real point of this. A lot of the pagan religions believe the cosmos is eternal in the past. It never was created. And at some point in time, some god or other showed up and just gave some order to an existing chaos. And the Bible says this is not correct. The god who inhabits eternity brought the created order into being out of nothing. He created the world out of nothing. Creation ex nihilo. That's how powerful our our God is. He created the world by his power. He spoke and there it was. It's done. He created the world out of absolutely nothing. And by the way, our God is well aware of everything that occurs at all times at every point in the created order. 
and he is causally active at all points in the created order, holding the whole thing together. In fact, Psalm 97 and verse 5 says that our Lord is the Lord of the whole earth. There's no little place where you can go to hide from God, not in your thought life, not in your conscience, not in your heart. Don't hold anything back. Don't say, I'm going to keep this little secret sin here because God doesn't see this one and I'll surrender everything else. No, give it everything to him. He knows what's happening anyhow. And you won't regret it, friends. You will not regret it. I never regretted it. It was the best decision I ever made with my life. I thank God for his divine persuasion. But our God, friends, and the Bible makes a big point of this too, he possesses the supreme right and the exclusive right to reign and to rule and to govern man as he pleases. He is a complete autocrat. (laughs) <laughs> he's a dictator. <laughs> he just so happens he's morally perfect, and he loves you, and you know that he loves you because there's an empty cross and an empty tomb to prove it. But look, please, at Psalm 96 and verse 4. 96, 4, for the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Yes, there is only one God, dear friends, who is God by nature. You know, the Apostle Paul says in Galatians, the fourth chapter, he says, you Galatians, in time past you did service to those things which are not gods by nature. You called them gods, but they're not really gods. You see, they're just big versions of us. The Greco-Roman pantheon of gods, they fight with each other, they deceive each other, they wound each other. They're just big versions of human beings. So they might, maybe, possibly, uh, sympathize with you when you're going through hard things, because they go through hard things, but they can't really help you. That's the problem. But you see, the God that we worship, He is transcendent. He is almighty. He is powerful, infinitely powerful. He can help you. Guess what else He is? Imminent. God became a man in the person of Christ Jesus to sympathize with the feelings of your infirmities. He can really sympathize. He knows what it's like to be abandoned, betrayed, misunderstood, wounded. He knows what it's all about. And he can do something about it. And there is no God in the history of world religion like this God, the God of gods, the God of the Bible, the covenant-keeping God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's one of a kind. There's nothing like him. He actually challenges us through his man Isaiah. Who will you compare me to? What in all the creation is like me, God says. And the answer is, nothing, Lord. I can't imagine anything quite like you. (laughs) And God says, there is something under heaven like me. You know what that is? Shocking. It's you. In all the world, the only creature God ever made that he declared to be in his image and likeness is humankind. And maybe that's why God's chosen to redeem fallen men and not fallen angels, because we are exclusively his image bearers in the world. Amazing mysteries, and we're part of this, you see? This is something worth contemplating. Well, our God is in charge, that we know for sure. In Psalm 95 and verse 3, he's called the great king. And in our unit of scripture that we're looking at here, you see a phrase repeated, the Lord reigns. That's kingship. That's sovereignty. Psalm 98 and verse 6 says, Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. He's the King of kings. And the heavenly King of kings, friends, is also one who dwells in awesome holiness. Big point made of that in the book of Leviticus, for example. Isaiah chapter 6 also. This means spotless, infinite, and unchanging perfection. Holiness the holy God of heaven. Look at Psalm 97 and verse 12. Look at Psalm 97. Just drop down to verse 12. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. His name is holy. That's why you don't dare take his name in vain. His name is holy. In Psalm 99 and verse 5, it says you're to exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. And in verse 9, 99, 9, it says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. Psalm 96, 9 says that we are to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness is beautiful to our God. Jesus called it 
worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. We're talking about uh, purity in our hearts and minds, in our souls and spirits, and in our bodies. Purity, friends, separateness from that which is vulgar, common, or profane. God wants purity amongst His people. When the Lord Jesus comes to call His church to that beautiful place He's gone to prepare for her, He's not coming for some wishy-washy, weak, helpless, spotted bride. He's coming for a spotless bride who's waiting for Him, who's been faithful to Him, who loves Him, honors Him, tells others about Him. That's what He's coming for. And Paul did everything he could to get the church ready for the return of Jesus. And that's our, that's our place in this, friends, to honor God while we're here. Wait for His Son from heaven. Turn from idols. Serve the living and true God. Wait for His Son from heaven. Pure love, pure devotion to God, worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. And that's essential, you see, because Hebrews, the 12th chapter, says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It doesn't matter how much Bible you've memorized. Without holiness, you will not see the Lord. It doesn't matter how many how much tithes you pay. It doesn't matter how much volunteer work you do. Uh, Paul, Paul says it. Without love, you're nothing. And our first duty is to love the God that loved us first with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. If that's not there, then uh, nothing else really matters. Isn't that true? Jesus was asked, what's the first and greatest commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself because that comes out of a heart that loves God. Then you love the things he loves too. Purity, devotion, love for God. And the holy God of heaven, dear friends, whose name is holy, is a God who speaks, and he's a God who judges, and he has the supreme right to be believed and obeyed. See? Our God isn't just uh, transcendent and unknowable. He has, he has a personality. This is a major point. The more the church gets influenced and corrupted with Greek modes of philosophical thought, the more our God becomes an impersonal force. The Bible absolutely cuts against this. The Bible wants us to know that our God is a personal agent. He's got a mind, will, and emotions, and he has an opinion on things, see? Look at Psalm 95. Just please go back, saints, to Psalm 95. And I'm just going to read now from verse 7 to the end of the chapter, just a couple verses here. But listen to this. I mean, we should get the force of this, all of us. Verse 7, For, we, uh, for he is our God, and we are the sheep of his pasture, the, uh, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For 40 years I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Look at God here disclosing his personality to us. He has a mind, he has a will, he has emotions, he has an opinion. Verse 10 says, he was 40 years grieved with people. God can be grieved? Yes. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, be careful, saints, don't grieve the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of promise by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption, the redemption of your body. Don't grieve God. You can grieve God, did you know? God is not impassively sitting in heaven watching what's happening, all the evil in the world, and, and he's unaffected by it. God can be grieved. It, the Bible says that when God looked at the pre-flood world, he was grieved at his heart, and he regretted that he made man on the earth. You ever have, you have regrets? You ever feel grieved? God knows those feelings. They're original with him. Why was God grieved? Because he loved Israel. He loved his covenant people, Israel, Deuteronomy 7 says he loved them, he rescued them, he preserved them, he blessed them, he provided for them with supernatural sign miracles and judgments. And he brought them out of bitter bondage in Egypt. He brought them right to the borders of the promised land. He said, now go in, my children, and take it. It's yours. And you know what Israel said to him? We don't trust you. We're going to go in there and all be killed. You're not going to protect our children if we go in here. How hurtful to God to talk like that. After all he did for them, do you remember just prior to that, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai and God was inscribing on a rock his law for those people to bless them. He wrote with his own finger in the rock and he's barely finished. And what are the people doing? Sinning horribly 
in ghastly fashion. I mean, they became so morally degraded down there at the foot of Mount Sinai. And God, by right, could have destroyed all of them and made a people out of Moses instead. But he didn't. He forgave those people. In fact, Psalm 99 and verse, verses 6 to 8, it goes on to say that God was known to Aaron and Moses as the God who forgives. They would have, heard, they would have known that, these people. He's the God who forgives. And the people still distrusted him. They still refused to trust him that he would look after them in the promised land. And God was grieved by this. Well, friends, you've read it. I've read it this morning. Psalm 95, verse 8. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. If you hear his voice today, don't harden your hearts as in the rebellion. In the light of all that you know about God, in light of all the ways that God has provided for you and blessed you and me, let's not harden our hearts to his word as those ingrateful, those ingrates, those ungrateful people did way back 1400 B.C., way back then. God wants us to know about it. Don't follow their terrible example. You can read all about it. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, God, God speaks through his man, Paul. He says, all these things happen as examples to us, not to, not to follow them. They're bad examples. Uh, look at the horrible tragedies that resulted from rebelling against God, hardening, hardening your heart to his known will. Friends, you and I are called to believe God and to believe in Him, to trust Him, to obey Him, and you'll find rest right now. You see what happened here? These people did not find rest. God says, I swore in my wrath they would not enter my rest. And Jesus says, today, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I'll give you rest for your weary soul. And the Bible says you'll have rest in the future too. I mean, that's for the next time we enter the Psalms. We're going to talk about the end of the world, the events that will precede, accompany, and follow the Lord's return. And he'll come in flaming fire, and he'll take vengeance on those who withstood him and his people, and he'll give us who loved and trusted the Savior rest, real rest. But for today, I want to say to non-believers, if there's any non-believer that can hear my voice, you're carrying a sin debt around. That takes effort. And not only are you carrying a sin debt, Heavy laden with iniquity, Isaiah says, you're carrying sins attending guilt with you. And that takes effort to carry that around too. And you might be laboring hard and working hard to distract yourself from it, trying to ignore it, distract yourself. Oh, the Western world has every kind of entertainment and distraction, but it doesn't really work, you know. The time comes when you have to lay alone in your bed and the thoughts come flooding back. There's all kinds of uncertainty. Am I really right with God? Where am I going when I die? I'm going to die. We're all, we all die. What happens? There's guilt. There's a sin debt. There's laboring to ignore it. Cast it out of your mind. Religious people work hard to try to work off that sin debt. They work hard to try to get absolved. They're trying to establish a righteousness of their own with God. That's national ethnic Israel's big problem to this very hour. They think that they can obey the Mosaic law and, and achieve a righteousness of their own that God will be pleased with. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. Because if your salvation is dependent upon your effort, you're always going to be left with a nagging uncertainty if you've done enough, if God is really pleased. Have, you, have I really worked off my sin debt? Have I really established myself as a righteous person in the eyes of God? You, you never know if it's based on self-effort. And the burden of fear and a fear of death and of judgment to come, that still remains. That's a burden too, you know. Well, Jesus says, soften your heart to me and to my word. Trust me as the one who can handle the problem. <laughs> Come to me, all you that labor in these ways and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I did that when I was 20 years old. I said, Lord Jesus, save me. I don't really understand all this, but I know that you came into the world to save me. I know that I'm guilty and you're not, but you died as though you were. You stood in my place somehow. I don't understand it. I prayed a simple prayer like that in my bedroom, and the world was new after that. And I didn't always live like a Christian in the early days, but in my heart of hearts, I never departed from God. I always knew 
that the Bible is his word and that God was in the world reconciling the world to himself by the blood of the cross. I always knew that. And that's amazing. That's an amazing transformation. It's supernatural. Adam came into the world suddenly, supernaturally, instantaneously. Isn't that true? God created Adam, a supernatural miracle, and made him a living being. And when you come to Jesus for salvation, you are suddenly and supernaturally, instantaneously changed into a new creature, created in Christ Jesus, now for good works. Trust him to handle the problem, and he'll take care of it. But friends, to, to believers, I would say this, in the light of what we've read this morning, never, ever stop trusting Christ the Lord, and never start relying on yourself. <laughs> it's, you know, it's sort of like marriage, you know. We, Lindy and I tell couples who are about to get married, to each spouse, never stop looking for ways to love and serve your spouse and never start looking for ways that you can be satisfied. And if the relationship runs like that, it's going to be pretty good. Well, when it comes to God, never stop trusting in Him and never start looking to yourself. It's a really bad idea to rely on yourself. We're just too small of gods to serve, <laughs> really. Paul wrote to the Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. He said, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Do you remember what it was like when you first came to Jesus for salvation? I remember. At that moment, nothing else really mattered. Everything goes into the shadows by comparison. All I know is that God was in Christ reconciling me to himself by the blood of that cross. All I know is there's a heaven and I'm going to go there. And Jesus Christ is very God of very God, and he's going to bring me there, right? These are very simple, low-level things, but th that's all that really mattered. You know, friends, up to the present hour, that's all that really matters. Mary found the one thing that was needful at the feet of Jesus. And you know what the Lord said about that? It will not be taken from her. And that's wise counsel for all of us. Find what you need at the feet of Jesus. It's there. It really is there. And I'm going to end here by reading... A passage from Ephesians, the fourth chapter, a little reminder to all of us to get our thinking clear and straight and, and keep it clear and straight. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17. We need to hear this, friends, because the world is constantly working at us to look at things its way, to pull our attention and allegiance away from Jesus. It's constant. It's day after day. Well, here are some amazing correctors here for us. Ephesians 4, verse 17. You ready? This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. Honestly, friends, I've never seen a world so steeped in stupidity as the world we live in right now. It's so sad that people who don't have a clue what they're talking about have access to microphones. <laughs> and they get the public square. Paul says these people are walking in the futility of their minds. Verse 18, having their understanding darkened, being alienated by, uh, from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not so learned Christ. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. That's as far as you need to look. The truth is in Jesus. Thank you, period. Is that helpful? I pray it is. Let's pray. We'll close right there. Our dear blessed and holy God of heaven, we're so grateful that you've called us aside from the rest of the world for one hour where we can cluster under this roof in safety and security and comfort and we can give special attention, special focus to Jesus of Nazareth who came into the world to pay our sin debt in full. We thank you for, oh God, we thank you for the sinless, spotless life of Jesus, his miracle-saturated ministry, the truths he taught. Thank you for his atoning work on the cross. Thank you for his victorious resurrection from the dead. And thank you for your infallible word, the Bible, that testifies to Jesus every page reminding us of Jesus and his holiness. And thank you, Lord, for the call to believe in him, to the saving of our souls. We thank you, God, now for the hope of heaven, and we thank you also for the important work you have for us to do. 
God, find us faithful. Find us faithful to the God who loved us first. Lord, we ask these things for the blessedness and the edification, the encouragement of your people here assembled under this roof and for the glory of the God who loved us first and for the blessedness and the salvation of those on the outside who don't yet know Jesus in a redemptive way. We pray for them also in Jesus' beautiful name, matchless name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, thank you so much, dear saints, and God bless you all.